Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope your lunch was delicious. During this morning session, we have focused on challenge, including climate and opportunity that may be provided by the technology innovations. We're now switching our focus to another overdue challenge of today's maritime industry, empowering women in the maritime community, <coughs> which has been chosen as the theme of World Marine Time Day 2019. Diversity has been taken up as an issue for decades, yet it is an unaccomplished mission in our industry and so many others. It is my true privilege to introduce the moderator of this session, successful leader, a recognized and respected industrial professional, a true friend of many, including myself, she has served, served as Managing Director of International Association of Independent Tanker Owners, which is widely known as Intertanko, since 2012. She was named the WISTA 2012 International Personality of the Year by Women's in Shipping Trade Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Katharina Stanzo and her panel. Cassie, the floor is yours. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We have the slot that is going to fight with your lunch. But I'm pretty sure that we're going to have such an interesting session, nobody will get some shut eyes. So, what I'm going to do first is introduce you to my panel this afternoon. Um, before I hand over to our sort of introductory speaker for the afternoon. And um, normally, when we have these kind of sessions in the shipping industry and probably in most other industries, I would start by saying, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> instead of gentlemen and ladies. And if you notice, our panel is diverse. We have a man on the panel, which is fantastic. So I'm going to go not ladies first, but gentlemen first. Let me introduce <laughs> to you, please, Mr. Guy Platten, who is actually not just the, the man that will actually show you why diversity matters, but he is also our only mariner. He's a master mariner by trade. He has looked after lifeboats, he's looked after lighthouses, um, he has looked after ferry companies before coming into the realm where he works now, which is with associations, shipping associations, because Guy is the present Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping, and I'm very Happy to have him on my panel. Welcome, Guy. Despina, I'll come back to you in a minute because I'll introduce you when you're speaking. Our next guest is Akiko Yoshida. Very welcome. And uh, now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Akiko because there was, with the typhoon, not so much chance to have her here with us today because Akiko is the Director General of Kanto District Transport um, and is therefore with the Ministry of Land Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism responsible for transport of Tokyo and the surrounding seven districts, I believe. So a big job and a very busy job, I think, in the last couple of weeks. So thank you very much for making time for us. Um, interestingly for me, Akiko and I were colleagues when she worked in London. Um, she has studied and worked overseas and in Japan, so she will bring a very international perspective with experience in the US, in the UK, and here in Japan to this panel, and I'm very happy to have you with us. And last but not least, we have your moderator for the whole day, your MC, Sakura Kuma. Um, I'm very happy that we have somebody from the port sector, because this event is really quite unique in that we are mixing ports and shipping and the dialogue between them. Um, and I think it's down to Maruka-san to have the vision to organize this. So I'm, I'm very happy that we're allowed to be here for the 160th anniversary, and happy anniversary for that. And I'm also very happy that in your anniversary year, we managed to get um, your executive director for Yokohama Port so heavily engaged in getting this event organized. Now, Sakura has obviously a lot of responsibility um, seconded, I understand, from NYK where she's been working a lot with container shipping, with terminals, and now dealing with the port. 
Um, also looking at LNG bunkering, which I think might be interesting for a few other sessions. So a really diverse panel, but last but not least, let me introduce you our introductory speaker, Despina Panayotuto Teodosio. Uh, Despina is the CEO of her own company, uh, Tototeo in Cyprus. Um, Tototeo is one of the, the leading um, technology providers, satellite communication, um, satellite communication, automation, um, navigation systems, all of those things. But Despina is also the current chairwoman of the Women International uh, Shipping and Trading Association. And as such, as the president of VISTA, it is great that she's going to give us the opening address today. Despina, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today and thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, I have been asked to talk today about um, diversity and to outline why diversity is key. But uh, the first question that came to my mind when I started you know, thinking about this uh, topic was a key to what exactly? Perhaps a key to a better society or the key to a better business environment, or a key to a more successful and sustainable modern shipping industry. Maybe all of them. We all know that uh, shipping and society are witnessing uh, some fundamental changes. Digitalization is creating new business opportunities and speeding up change. And when I look at the number of startups, and also the companies that are eagerly seeking the help of these startups, particularly over the last 12 months, I see that change is speeding up. Data, its collection, and then its assessment, followed by decision-making feedback to make improvements, is a vital tool for vessel performance. There is a new wave of solutions coming. Well, really, we should say they're already here. Drones, blockchain, digital control centers, autonomous systems, systems decision-making support. These are not things of science fiction. Dr. Stopford mentioned Amazon Prime before. It's the same as, you know, telling Alexa or Cortana or Google to order a pizza while standing in your kitchen. It's no longer science fiction either. Our industry, our world, is also facing an unprecedented pressure to undergo another technological revolution and move into a decarbonized society. The pressure is on, not only to save fuel and reduce emissions, but to totally remove those, omission, those emissions altogether. It really does not matter whether you or I believe in climate change or not. The IMO has made a decision with a roadmap under development. In Europe, the decision has been made and the data collection requirements that both the IMO and the EU have now made mandatory are signs that these changes are here to stay. We also see countries coming out in support of a decarbonized transport chain, supporting with grants and funds the transformation of shipping into a truly sustainable industry. All the countries that want to be the leading nations in the new maritime world, they all see digitalization as a key enabler to this. This is a time when the technologies that cause the problems cannot be the technologies that solve them. There is research, there is investment, and there are those that believe in hydrogen, ammonia, fuel cells, batteries, wind assist technology. There are those that see the benefits of autonomous ships or unmanned ships and high-speed connectivity. As an industry, as a society, we are changing. And that means all of us. And this is where I bring diversity into this. I will say it again. What causes the problems will not be what gets us out of it. We need new technologies and we need new systems. Nor will the same way of thinking or acting help us improve. Diversity is a key to getting this right. Industry needs new thinkers, new ways of thinking. It needs a diverse area of thinking. It needs everyone to have the chance to become part of the answer. It is happening. For example, in the UK, 
there are more women taking science-related degrees than boys, and girls are now, on average, getting better grades than boys across all subjects. Women are engineers, scientists, researchers, and in business. There is a similar story in other countries, and yes, it is encouraging. Women have a seat at the table, but there's more to this discussion than that. The maritime industry is, of course, international, we all know that, and competitive, another fact we all know. Different clusters have different strengths and different potential. Diversity means being able to bring all the tools, thoughts and ideas to the table. And that means different people from different backgrounds and different ways of thinking. If a company employs the same people all the time, or the same type of people, they are more likely to get the same thinking. Research into diversity has revealed that if you get a range of ideas to challenges, um, it gives you a different uh, uh, range of challenges and a different way of succeeding. Having diversity pays. Um, there is research from different consultancy groups at the bottom line of companies comparing those with a more proactive diversity program than those who do not have one at all. Bringing more women, people from different ethnic backgrounds, diversity, does not negatively impact the bottom line. Quite the opposite, in fact. This is why diversity is key. A diverse workforce has a positive impact on a company's profits. Last month, um, at a WISTA event in, in London, uh, the IMO Secretary General gave a speech about the huge changes that we see in the industry. He pointed out that in the next 10 to 20 years, shipping will see as many changes as it has done in the last 100. From clean fuel demands to digitalization and robotics, shipping is entering a new era. There are new jobs, new roles, new functions in the industry. He also pointed out that women now help drive the decision-making process. Women are challenging the status quo. He pointed out that diversity is better for leadership and better for the industry. He put it down to mindset. Our mindset is to challenge this status quo. Just as shipping in general needs to challenge its own technological and business assumptions. Diversity is one of the keys to finding a new mindset in shipping. I would like to turn briefly to seafaring. The IMO day of the seafarer for the theme for 2019 was significant. I am on board with gender equality. It was a call for those in the industry to consider their own commitment to building a workforce that is diverse and is equal. For all of us, the I in that statement raises a question about what you, as an individual, do or can do to raise the levels of gender equality. It supports the World Maritime Day theme of empowering women in the maritime community. It provides an opportunity to highlight the contributions that women are already making in a wide range of maritime careers and professions. The role of the seafarer is as relevant today as it was 100 years ago, it, but it certainly has changed. Our industry, or to be more precise, the range of industries that make up the maritime and shipping sectors, are evolving more rapidly than perhaps they have ever done. We have been talking already about how vessels are getting more sophisticated, connected, and subject to ever-increasing regulations and other requirements. Therefore, the more sophisticated the vessels, the more demand for a review of the skills needed to manage or operate them effectively. Countries that supply the majority of seafarers have traditionally sought young men to go to training colleges. This is changing. We see colleges now making more effort to persuade young women to pursue a seaborne career to gain certification as an officer. At the grassroots level, these colleges in countries such as India and the Philippines and China, they have the challenge of persuading these young women, but also their parents, that a seafaring career is a valuable one for them. Once a young school leaver has opted to go to maritime college, they should then be encouraged to stay in the industry. Young women need the support to retain their levels of interest. This is another challenge. We need an industry that remains attractive, and we need ships that are welcoming workplaces. Women are part of this solution. We need women to go to sea. 
we cannot solve the future challenges of crew shortages by continuing to do the same things. You will now have heard me say this a number of times. We cannot do things the same way we were doing it before. And yes, diversity is part of the answer. It is key to solving our future crewing challenges. As I mentioned earlier, studies were made by consultants such as uh, the Boston Cons Consulting Group and EY and uh, McKinsey, different, different uh, consultants. And they all highlight how gender diversity can have a positive impact on any company's revenues. Companies that have engaged in gender diversity programs and initiated policies have seen diversity lead to more creativity and more innovation, resulting in better corporate performance. This is good news. However, a new report highlights a significant gap between the expectations of managers and of women and minorities in the workplace. Companies need to ensure that their diversity programs are fit for purpose and meet the needs of those that they are aimed at supporting. At WISTA, we encourage all men and women in the industry to promote diversity, asking them to sign our inclusion pledge. It is a challenge to the maritime community to support diversity and inclusion. We ask companies to support women in their organization to encourage their growth and development. We seek role models and success stories to share, to empower other women to continue their careers in the industry and show other companies what they too can do to use diversity as a leadership tool, but also for profit. Things are changing quickly with digitalization and technological revolution. And we need diversity recognition to change just as quickly now. Sustainability is not only about having the right environmental solutions. It is also about having the right social ones that will help ensure that your business, even your countries, have sustainable economies. To conclude, diversity is the key. It is a key to a sustainable future for our industry. And today, it is up to us if we will use that key. We have a wonderful opportunity to create the bedrock for an advanced, successful industry, one that is fit for purpose in the sustainable societies that we're developing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Espina. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have some brief introductory statements, but um, before I ask my, my fellow panelists to sort of give you their thoughts about um, why we're still talking about this topic and, and what empowered them to be here, and that's including Guy, I want to tell you something that happened to me last week, on Friday last week. Um, I was in Tokyo, and, well, no, one thing happened that has nothing to do with this conference. I met the Japanese rugby team in the lobby of the hotel. I was very happy. <laughs> but apart from that, something else happened. I read in the newspaper that for the first time in history of mankind, an all-female spacewalk had taken place on the International Space Station. Why is that relevant? Well, to me, it was interesting because... Um, is it such a big deal that it's an all-female spacewalk? Well, it was, because actually, it happened to be that there were two women at the same time on the International Space Station. So that's just um, statistics. There's not that many in the astronaut corps, so there happened to be two of them. And the other thing is, they didn't, before this week, have enough medium-size spacesuits on the International Space Station. They were only very recently developed. They tried to do this before, but they didn't. They had more big ones than small ones. So its opportunity wasn't there before. And it reminded me that when I was a little girl, I wanted to be an astronaut. Mm. Um, that was my, my goal in life until I graduated from university. And um, when I graduated from my first degree, my professor said, well, if you want to be in the Space Corps, you need to speak either Russian or English, neither of which I did at the time. And I opted for English, ended up in Australia, changed my career, and the rest is history. But it's, it's one of those things that brings me back, because you in Japan have two female astronauts that have been to space already, and one of them, um, Yamazaki-san, has actually, she's born in the same year as me. She's, she's my vintage, um, and she's been to space. 
my home country, Germany, we still don't have a woman in space. We haven't got anyone who's made the astronaut selection and, and became an aerospace engineer like Yamazaki-san. So I'm, I'm quite proud to be in Japan when we have the first all-female spacewalk. But ultimately, it's just about statistics. If you, if you think about it, um, a total, as of the beginning of October, a total of 564 human beings have been to space. 564. 65 of them were female. That's 11.5%. That's not bad at all, because if I look at seafaring, as Despina has mentioned, if we look at seafaring alone, we have 125 million seafarers in the world, um, on about yeah, 70,000 ships, um, just 2% of those are female. So there's more female astronauts than seafarers in proportion. So this is again about statistics. Um, it's about diversity. It's about just making sure that we use the knowledge that we have from all these research projects now, and actually we become more profitable companies that make better decisions with more innovation because we do it together, because we challenge each other, we think different, and it's about inclusion. It's not about gender, actually. It's about diversity. And I think um, all of us here on the panel have demonstrated that in one way or another. Um, in Japan, you have a history of that. Um, I know NYK promoted their first female <coughs> captain um, in 2017, I believe, um, which, is, which is great, because it just sends the message that the times are changing, the numbers are changing, therefore the statistics are changing. And if we look at the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that as humanity we have signed up to effectively, SDG number five is about gender equality. Um, that might be a little bit far in terms of numbers, and it might not be necessary in terms of numbers, but what's necessary is it has to be gender equality when it comes to opportunity. So, like the spacewalk happening because they have the suits when they need them, it's about opportunity and it's about the numbers and it's about inclusiveness. So, I want to ask my panel now to just give us a quick introduction to their thinking about why are we talking about empowering women and gender equality in this whole context. Guy, do you want to kick us off? Thank you very much as the man on the, uh, on the panel. Um, yeah, this is something I really feel very strongly about, um, and it's not something that's come to me later on. It's something from really from when I was a child, because I've had throughout my life some very strong role models, some very strong female role models. My grandmother, my mother, my aunt, my wife now, and I've got two daughters as well. So it's something... I, I, you know, equal opportunity uh, is so important to me. Um, and it's sad in a way that we're even having this debate here. We shouldn't be having it, but it's necessary. It really is necessary. And I still think there is some outdated prejudices and viewpoints out there. I, I remember when I, I first started work, it was as a, a Saturday sales assistant for a retail chain in the United Kingdom. And I remember when I was offered the job, the manager said, uh, are you going to be okay working for a female manager because the department manager was female? Is that going to be a problem? And it was uh, alien to me then as it would be now. And you'd think things have moved on, but sadly there's some examples where it hasn't. So my daughter, who is also a seafarer, one of the 2%, she was promoted to be captain last year in 2018. And she works for a ferry company. Um, firstly, they made such a song and dance about it, she was embarrassed about it uh, because she was the first female captain. But she did get a teddy bear named after her, so that's, that's a positive. Um, but shortly after she was promoted to captain, the ferry company concerned had three unfortunate incidents. There was a couple of groundings and a collision. And somebody pasted on their Facebook page, isn't it funny, and, and I'll just, just pause her a second, in the UK we have a... Uh, an old bad joke about women drivers. It's, it wasn't funny 20, 30 years ago, it's certainly not funny now. But somebody had posted on their Facebook page, isn't it funny, Red Funnel have had all these accidents shortly after they promoted a female captain. <laughs> now, that's totally wrong. And also, uh, it's not exclusive to our industry. It's, uh, my, my wife's a chief executive of a, a successful company, employs 3,000 people. The company itself is owned by a private equity firm. 
and every year they have a, a gathering of the investors and the wealth managers to see the progress of the companies. And there was a reception before the, the night before, and one of the investors came up to, her, to ask her, so you're one of the PAs, are you? So these things are still there, and they're, they're absolutely wrong, and we have to challenge them. And you know, that is why I think these sort of forums are, are really, really important. There's some inspiring women on the panel here who've, despite these prejudices, have, have actually succeeded, and that's such a role model for, for young people coming in, because this is an amazing industry. I think we're further ahead than some industries, actually. I don't think we should knock ourselves too much. I think, we're, we, I think we've got the memo now and we're starting to change, albeit slowly. So I think that's, that's really important. But we are an attractive industry. We, we are a, a, a well-remunerated industry as well. You can really achieve your goals, and I think we need to get that message to that other half of the population to get that 2% up to 50% over time. So I'll stop at that. I'm looking forward to the rest of the debate, but uh, I think that's my, my initial viewpoint anyway. Thank you. Kathy. Okay, thank you. Despina, do you want to jump in now or later? Do you come in? Um, I, I can wait. Okay. Akiko, what are your thoughts? You have lived in many different countries and have seen various, various, uh, what do we call it, systems effectively that you've worked in. What do you think? Why are we discussing it? Okay, um, first let me thank uh, for the organizer and uh, our distinguished uh, moderator to invite me to speak at this um, panel. Uh, as you kindly introduced, um, uh, our organization is now uh, tackling with the uh, typhoon uh, damages. So if I receive an emergency call here, uh, please <laughs> allow me to go back to my office, which is uh, a few blocks away. But, um, but I came here because I think this issue, this agenda is very important, not only for the maritime sector, but also in Japan as well. Uh, I'm not sure you might know or not, but in Japan, um, for example, in the World Economic Forum ranking, gender equality, Japan uh, is a place 110 uh, out of 147 countries, which is far behind from other so-called advanced countries, OECD countries. So there's something about gender issue in Japan. Uh, in Buddhism religion, there's a term that, uh, there's a term, inga oho, which means there must be the reason behind what is happening now, or what you are seeing now. So I believe uh, for the situation, as I mentioned in this uh, World Economic Forum ranking, uh, there's something which is um, hampering the, the gender from gender equality is achieved in Japan. It could be a social one, or it could be a cultural one, I'm not sure. So afterwards, I'd like to switch my speaking to Japanese so that I can ensure my message directly goes to the Japanese audience today, if, if it's possible. But uh, um, regarding um, <clears throat> Regarding women empowerment, um, this is a term in English, and in Japan, we call it uh, Jose Katsuyak, or Roman Shine. That's a term uh, which Japanese government is promoting as a nation hall. So women empowerment issue might be, uh, might be relevant, especially for my time sector, for example, in European countries, but in Japan, it's applies to almost entire sectors because uh, very, um, for, example, for example, very relatively um, fewer number of female workers uh, participate in the workforce relatively uh, compared with other Western countries. And also, especially decision-making positions, status, much fewer number of females are participating. So there are two aspects of women empowerment in Japan, maybe in European countries, women in the maritime sector. So comparing the, um, this Asian or Japanese situation with the Western situation, I think there be, there be several factors behind. One is um, traditional concept or notion about the role of women, especially in, in household and workforce. 
And there might be a bias against the uh, female, uh, female capabilities. So from the statistics and from my own experience working in Japan and also overseas and the United States and the UK, uh, these are just, uh, how to say, um, just a prejudice. The difference of capability or difference of expected role in workforce or home households, it's just an um, individual matter. You have to, you all can uh, overcome. So, uh, in Japan's context, I think, uh, first we have to overcome that kind of cultural, uh, deeply embedded uh, concept, I think. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Do you want to continue with the message in Japanese now or later? Uh, later. In, in the discussion. Perfect. In that case, Sakura. Okay. Thank you for passing the torch. <laughs> um, what I would like to say is I'm so happy that in celebration of the 160th anniversary of the port, we can have this panel focusing on diversity. And actually, um, Despina Guy and uh, Cassie and with two other ladies, we were in the same theme of panel in IMO. That was uh, May this year, I guess. So there was a lot of energy that we saw from the floor. And at that moment, I uh, consulted with my boss, who is sitting over there, Moroka san I said, I really want to bring that energy to Yokohama, because this is really, when we celebrate the birthday of this port, and when we're looking forward to the future, and this is exactly one of the topics we need to focus on. And also, I'm so glad that uh, Yoshida-san, she's super busy, and well, uh, his, her duty, a lot of things going on, still she's willing to take this role and joining us, so thank you very much. So in terms of uh, diversity, I'm not a socialist, I'm not a feminist. I don't want to put things into the extreme, like some people, some activists might argue on the climate issue. Climate is an issue, but uh, just the way how we address it or how we look into it. The same as diversity. I just think that we need to look into facts some topics, the more we talk, the more we think, then the betterment that we can make. So today, at the beginning, I would like to share a fact. Actually, it is a story with all of you. You know, in the port sectors, not so many female working in this sector, and I'm so blessed because I have been blessed by many mentors on the way and I've been given opportunities so, so that I can become who I am today. Um, in the port sectors gathering, you'll see, but I will always see I'm the only woman in the room, but I don't feel lonely or alone because even I'm surrounded by the male, but I know most of them are very friendly and encouraging. There is a... Um, a friend I call, he's probably 65 or something. At a gathering, he told me a story about himself. So he has one daughter, two sons. Uh, when his children was little, uh, his boys always complained to their father, says, Dad, it's unfair. You're just so strict to us, but you're so sweet to our little sister. We just don't know why. And the father told their kids, way back years ago, he goes, Sons, when you're grown up, you can do anything. You can be anyone. But your little sister, when, he, when she grow up, she'll get married. She'll have a family. She'll prioritize all the interests of the family members, put them in front of herself. She'll have parents-in-law, sisters-in-law, brothers-in-law, husband, and demanding children. At least, now I can give her something sweet to remember. 
that wasn't decades ago. That was that conversation. He told me the story just within one year, okay, and I couldn't. I just couldn't forget about it. And guess what? Um, nowadays, his two sons grown up and have their own family. Their sons are doing exactly the same thing as their father did to their little daughters. So this story is really reminding us something that you can ignore. Say, okay, diversity doesn't. This is it's not a matter. But you can also look into different angles. See, things is still there, but to what extent? That's depend on the situations. I'm so glad we also have a loving father here, <laughs> whose daughter is a captain of a, um, a ferry service, right? So my point is, this is our issue. If you are male, think about your daughter's future, and if you are a female. Think about yourself. Think about your mothers, and think also about your daughter's future. Not only daughters and sons, because the future world needs to be equal. You want your children equally happy, no matter it's a boy or a girl. That's my story. Thank you. Thank you, Sakura. So it's interesting that we've already picked up on a common theme in some of these presentations, and it's the theme of role models and. Traditional concepts and unconscious bias, I think, and it's it's a it's an interesting piece because I've recently um, spoken a lot with the UK Maritime and Coast Guard Agency because they have looked at unconscious bias as something that is damaging their recruitment in um, surveyors. They were looking for marine surveyors, and they found that the workforce was 98% male, despite what Despina said, despite the fact that if you look at the statistics and you look at Female graduates of um, universities or, or technical colleges, it should be a higher number. It didn't make sense, so they worked with Harvard University to do some re to do some research, and unfortunately, the results were really disappointing because they're very common sense. The results were well, if there's no role models that people can aspire to, if they don't see images of females. And in the morning session, I was I was tickled because Martin said he'd used the wrong slide. Um, <laughs> there weren't any women on it, but it it is about having images, just seeing that it's an option for whatever gender, male or female, it doesn't matter. And what the MCA have done together with Harvard is, for example, they've used um, a tool that picks up bias in the language. And they basically put all their job advertisements now through a gender um, decoding tool, effectively. And the tool removes language that is either specifically more female or specifically more male and makes it more neutral. And the effect results that they've had over three years is that their in recruitment of female candidates has increased by 30% compared to before but the recruitment of male candidates hasn't changed. So it has no negative effect, it just has a positive effect for, for diversity. So it's, it's interesting that we're starting to look at this and we're starting to do something about it and address that unconscious bias. And I'm just wondering, Sakura, you've already started talking about what, what empowered you, and I think this is, this is something that I wanted to ask the panel because I think the topic is, you know, how did we all get here? And how can we make sure that that diversity is borne out so that we make the best decisions. Um, we actually have a, a first question on Slido already, which relates to groupthink. Somebody is saying, well, how can we use, or well, what does diversity do with groupthink? And I think we've, we've looked at research recently that says that, for example, if you have a board of directors, um, as the Spina said, they, they have actually quantified the effect on productivity of a company, 15% increase if you have more women, 35% increase if you're even more diverse in terms of cultures, in terms of backgrounds. Um, so there is a net effect, but how do we stop groupthink? And I think it is that diversity in thinking. Um, I read somewhere that on any board, you need at least three of one type of person, whether that is a woman or another ethnicity or something else to make a difference and probably to have enough emphasis and to break that groupthink. 
Do you have any experience with that in your day-to-day -day jobs? Um, uh, if I can. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say that um, we, we also need to say the positives as well. And, and I think, um, and in my experience, we have come a long way. Because today I'm able to stand there and talk to you about diversity in terms of um, uh, sustainability and technology. And this is something I couldn't even dream of a few years ago. When um, I started Wista Cyprus eight years ago, and even when I became president of Wista International two years ago, um, even talking about diversity per se was a, a touchy subject. You had to be careful how your message comes across. But now, uh, we can speak more openly, um, we can have discussions, because it's not about talking to people about, about diversity, but it's about having a conversation and discussing it, because it's the only way to go forward. In terms of companies, you know, I, um, I have, uh, through the you know, last uh, couple of years, spoken to many big companies around the world and how they deal with diversity. Uh, some of, are of the opinion that it should start from the top. Uh, some others think that it's an issue that needs to be dealt with uh, from middle management so that it can also go to uh, lower levels of, of, of the company. My experience has been that it needs to be a strategy that encompasses everything. Because if there's buying from the CEO, it's very important. But if you cannot get that message across to the rest of the people in your company, then it's never going to work. The same thing, if there's buy-in from middle management and then the CEO or the, the board do not agree, then for sure any diversity initiatives will not progress. Um, so uh, I believe that companies that want to go that route, they really need to dig deep and, and, and try to have um, conversations within the company, but also create initiatives that will make sure involve everyone. Um, it's, it's very important to have everyone understand the need um, for, uh, for diversity in a company. Um, very recently in our company, and it's a, it's a medium-sized company, we, we, we had our, um, our, our company update, uh, and one of the things we discussed was how do we fare in terms of numbers uh, for men and women in the company. And, and, and not only that, but we discussed other things on diversity as well. We, we, we dug deeper. So um, people know that it's the expectation mm -hmm. that they are on board with diversity. Um, and even if they disagree with it or they have some issues, they know that uh, there is a, a free... Um, environment there that they can discuss what they have to say and, and I, I, I truly believe that discussion even if there are opposing opinions is uh, fundamental to this because we cannot shut down the opposing opinions. Uh, that is no way to create change. The way to create change is to have consensus. So I think that's only done with uh, being open-minded and having the discussions. Showing leadership I guess in your case, yeah. How do you deal with that in your board, Guy? Is that an issue? Well, if I look around the ICS board, I can think of it's probably four or five female CEOs of, of the National Ship Owners Associations. So we're, we're a long way to go, but I do sense we're, getting, we're starting to get there because we're having a different viewpoint. And there's no doubt that a diverse board produces the best possible results. In, you know, when I ran a ferry company up in, in Scotland, it was a 50-50 gender balance. And I think men tend to be more prepared to take risks. That's just in, in that. And I think you have uh, women tend to be a bit more risk averse. And I think actually that studies have shown that, that actually the two together, you reach then the best results. Otherwise you get this group think we must go head long into something without thinking about all the, the, the possible scenarios. So I think there's a, there's a real balance there. And I think it's shown to be uh, shown to work. But I think there's, there's so much more that we can do. But I think you touched on it. It's about leadership and it's about attitude. And it's also not, it's also acknowledging that people have got issues, and, but challenging those issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think the group, the way to get over group thing is for individuals to embrace the whole idea of diversity and gender balance and um, hopefully challenge that group thing. 
I mean, on my board, since um, I've been in the position nine years, we have tripled the number of women on the board, but my board is very large. We have 126 members of the board, and um, the number of females on the board, um, I said it had tripled, um, they are now three. <laughs> yeah. But that's not bad, because you know, statistics um, can be used for anything. So we're actively trying to change that. Um, it is on our part, of course, an election process. It's about the perceived competence of women. It's about the willingness to stand. Um, so for us, it's possibly easier than from a government perspective. Akiko, do you have any, any experience in the government? How do you deal with that aspect? Uh, yes, uh, Japanese government now has a number, target number, for example, the new recruitment for government officials in Tokyo, uh, we, have a, we have a target number of more than 30%. Uh, the each agency or ministry should employ female officials. 30%? That works. Wow. And now I'd like to switch to Japanese because I'd like to address this issue in the Japanese context. If it's okay. Diversity. Sorry. Channel two. Diversity という時にですね、あのまあ気をつけないといけないところもあると思っております。あ特に日本での場合ですね。と言いますのは、あの特にまあボードであるとかその意思決定のあの期間において、まあ多様な意見を反映するという意味でまあ女性を入れるべきだという意見があります。あのこれはこれであの正当性を持つ意見だと思っております。で特にあの例えば最近まあコンプライアンスですとかの関係ですとかあのセクシャルハラスメントですとかまあそういった課題についてまあ女性の方がよりあのまあなんていうんですか気づきやすいと言いますかえそういった社会的な問題に対するまあ感覚がよりあのなんていうんですかまあ。えー、気づきやすいということで、まあ、そういったちょっと違ったこれまでの、まあ、よくいわゆる中年あるいはそれ以上の年齢の男性ばかりの意思決定機関に対して、まあ、女性を入れることの意義ということは、まあ、言われることはありますただあの私は気をつけなければいけないのはですねそういうことがあまりにも強調されるとじゃあ女性をディシジョンメイキングのプロセスに入れるというのは女性だけの観点を期待するのかと。いいいいううことにななっっててしままかねないというふうに思っておりますそうではなくて女性の社会参加あるいは女性のディシジョンメイクプロセスへの参加を増やすというのは単に埋もれていたタレントを2倍にすると気づかれなかったタレントこれまで日本の伝統的な家庭観であれば家庭に入っていた人がもしかしたら社会に出て働きはもっと違ったアイデアを持っていたりもっと違った能力があったかもしれないそういったタレントが2倍になるというふうな捉え方をすべきであってそういった中の一つとして、まあ、女性としての,あの特に他の、まあえー、なんですかビロンギングといいますか属性の人には気づかれなかった観点を持ち込むこともあると、まあ、そういった観点でむしろ、えー、取り扱うううべきではないいいかというふうに思ってますそうでないとあの日本だと特によく言われるのがですねこれはやっぱり女性がいた方がこう細やかだよねとかですねあのそういったいやさすが女性がいるから細やかだよねとかですね割とこう賠償化された使い方をされることが日本社会ではあり得るあのそういったことを私は感じます。そういった意味ではダイバーシティということをプロモートする際に非常に重要な概念ではあるんですけどもそれだけを強調するのではなくてやはり女性も別にその,その多様性を増やすためだけにいるんじゃなくてその人そのもののタレントがもそもそもあるんだということはきちんと理解されるべきであるというふうに私は思います。Yes, best man for the job is what you're saying. <laughs> Another sort of the bias, right? Yes. Toward women. So Absolutely. Because you're a woman, you're modest, or things like that. That's another bias.、Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, how, how do we, in a Japanese context then, because this is a question we're getting on Trello, what do we need to do?、Mm -hmm. In Japanese context? In the, con in the Japanese context. Are there ideas that you've collected while you were traveling, or Sakura, you have seen in the port environment? What could we be doing? What could all of us be doing when we leave here today? Well, there's a tons of things that we can do. First of all, like Yoshida san just mentioned, there's a, another kind of bias towards women. So,、uh, the group 
probably accept, expect the women bringing more uh, soft, mild things like that. So um, that, that sort of bias and how to clear that, it's again coming back to the first question, the group thinking. I mean, uh, the leadership obviously do a lot of with mindset changing and the leadership is from the outside or maybe you can take the leadership, but so whatever, no matter where the leadership is, I think we can all change from ourselves. Start to change your mindset, just because I'm a girl, I, I don't necessarily need to do this. Just because I'm a boy, doesn't mean I necessarily can have, you know, uh, can be stronger, things like that, you know, physically. Nowadays, even women can play uh, pro rugby, right? <laughs> It's me, I, I mean, everybody can do anything. Everything is possible, so change the mind, mindset. Everything is possible doesn't mean you have to do everything. So that's another different, you know, bias. I, there's a lot of young women, last time when I was in a, a Norship, uh, the Wista Norway had a, had a sessions, and these young ladies in our industries, they get so emotional, says, uh, I have to try my best, otherwise the boys will just say I took their chance away. But my, my opinion is when you want to really change from yourself, then you really have to think for yourself, by yourself. It's not because of people think how you are, who you are, what you are. It's how you do to evaluate yourself. So that's a strong, I mean, it's a gut to take. Uh, when we talk about leadership from outside, from above, if you have a mentor, a good one, you can go to uh, consult with, which is good. But if you can change from yourself, you know, have this hardcore and uh, don't really, you know, be waved by what people think about you, you know, just be yourself. And then uh, take steps by step. You know, you probably are not like other people expect you to be. Like we all have the experience. I guess you have that too. So no matter what the expectation on you, so try to do your best. And then step by step, and try to get more mentors. You know, at, at the level of organization, of course, leadership is a key to change the mindset of the group thinking. But the group thinking can be crushed from above or from bottom. So we can have both approach. Can I say something there? Uh, I, I completely agree, but I think um, there has been an underlying notion that when we talk, uh, talk about diversity and changing the mindset, uh, there's an expectation that men change their mindset. Um, and it's not that. Um, that's something even within WISTA we had to address and really look at what we do and reevaluate. And um, in the end, when it's only women talking about diversity, where's the diversity in that? So we shouldn't uh, be thinking about uh, diversity um, only from the women's perspective in the industry, but from the people's perspective in the industry. And, and men are absolutely critical in this discussion because we cannot go forward if we don't all sit down together and talk about diversity. Um, so, um, and... And also, in terms of that, we I even mentioned and we all mentioned the um, uh, necessity of having role models so that girls can see women on those slides and see, think, oh, I can do it. But we should never discount the fact that men and older men in the industry can be very good mentors for these young women. Right. Um, so we need to start opening our mind up a little bit. Uh, if we're ever to achieve true diversity in the industry. あの、その、その日本の組織では、ま、企業だともうメンターシステムっていうのがあるのかもしれませんけど、なかなかあの政府であるとか、ま、それ以外の組織ではなかなかそのメンターシステムそのものがあるところが少ないと思います。で、まず
でそれとですね私あの、まあ、30年以上働いてきてでいろんなところで働いて、えー、思うのはですね特に日本のまたコンテクストで申し上げるとメンターだけではなくてプロモーターが必要だというふうに思います。いまだにですねやはりその非常にあの特にあのあの西洋文化社会とあの日本で働くとですねあの謙虚さといいますか自分の成果をどういうふうにアピールするかっていうアチシュードがもう全く違います。でこういうとちょっと怒られるかもしれませんけども海外だとそのリクルートの段階でもですねもう自分が本当にできなくてもできますと言ってインタビュー受けに来てですね<笑>であの自分の業績評価でもですねあのかなり水,水増しとは言わないですけどもかなりあの自信を持ってあのマネージャーとディスカッションをしてあの業績評価を固めていくっていうプロセスが多分普通にやっていると思いますけども日本ではまだなかなかそこまでは行っていなくてですねで非常にやはりそのハンブルであるというか謙虚であることが尊ばれる組織、まあ、社会でありますからで特にそのまあ統計的にもこれまでの調査的にもまあ女性は特に謙虚さが求められてきた、まあ、そういうまあキャラクターを今も持っている人が非常に多い、まあ、ほとんどそうだと思います。そういった中でですねあの彼彼女、まあ、これは女性だけに限らないかもしれませんけどもそういった中で、まあ、実際どういう貢献をしているのかどういう仕事ぶりをしているのかということをですねきちんと見てで彼女はこんな貢献をしていると言ってすくい上げてあげる引っ張り上げてあげるそういうことが、まあ、特に日本ですとか、まあ、アジアのですねそういった何、あのー、て言いますか労働社会というかね社会ではあの必要なのではないかというふうに思います。うん Probably not just in Japan, I think.、Yes. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> it's a very good point. It, it was interesting because Sakura mentioned something that happened at North Shipping, which I remember as well. We had a panel where we talked about entrance to the industry, and we had somebody who stood up, asked a question, and broke down in tears. And yes, she was a woman,、yeah. um, but I think she fundamentally confused the difference between a gender issue and a resilience issue.、Right. And I think this is something that is probably not specific to any nation. It's just specific to our industry. It does take resilience to do this job because it's sometimes hard, it's sometimes exhausting, it's sometimes、um, taxing at an emotional level.、Right. And when, especially when young people or middle management people in this industry start growing, whether they're male or female doesn't matter, building resilience is important. And that Requires leadership in terms of the mentor and the coaching, being sensitive to it, helping them find their own way. I think、um, nothing to do with gender issues, but separating the two and saying, in a diverse workforce, we're also dealing now with Generation X and you know, the, the, different, the different mindsets、mm. of people coming into this industry. So I think. The discussion that we're having about bringing new people into the industry, into maritime, is nothing to do with gender most of the time.、Um, oh. If I can, I, I ha, so, sorry, Guy, if I can, I have an experience、uh, in regards to that. A few years ago, I was、uh, moderating a,、uh, a panel in Cyprus on,、uh, for young、uh, shipping executives. So it wasn't a gender panel, it was for young people. And、uh, one young lady stood up and asked me repeatedly, how many, how many hours do I have to work per week to be successful in shipping? <laughs> and I was thinking, but of course I couldn't say it. If you're asking how many hours you need to work in shipping, then you'll probably never succeed. <laughs> so、uh, I agree with you.、Uh, sometimes we confuse the diversity issue with the、uh, resilience issue. Um, and indeed, you're very right. We're at this point now where we need to attract people to the industry, not, not only young women, but also young men.、Um, so I think that's where the shift is coming. That's where we need to start rearranging our thinking and how we see our industry. And of course, the fact that we see so many changes because of regulation and because of the technology, it has put us in that mindset to start thinking change. And that question could be asked by a boy as well. Yeah, yes, yes. So this、oh, is not a gender issue. Obviously.、Right. I'm sure many thought the same. <laughs> like, I just wonder whether we, it starts much earlier than when you start work. It's, it's at school as well, isn't it? When, is there, do we teach diversity at school? So 
I was speaking to some female cadets and I said, you know, basically we want far more women to get into the seafaring profession. And I said to this young lady, you know, you know how did you get into it? And, you know, what was your drivers? And why aren't there more of your colleagues here? And she said, well, it starts at 14 in the UK at least, where you have to specialise. And all her friends went for art and English and drama and other type subjects like that. And the science wasn't a big thing. So very few of them then studied science, particularly after the age of 14. So, of course, in the seafaring, you need that science background in order to get into seafaring. So, to me, it's not just about um, making our, our industry welcoming. To, it's also about getting, reaching beyond to where they're at school to actually encourage everybody that there's a, there's a great career and, and it's, they, people aren't channeled down the law or teaching or other sort of stereotypical type career paths so that actually we explain there's a real diverse range of options out there. So just, oh, you know, from your own experience, is, is that something you encountered at school? Mm. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. When, when um, you know, girls go to the uh, teachers that, uh, the consultants, or they give you guidance on, on your professional, future professional life, I think it's not the immediate thought that they suggest science or maritime or, um, you know, in my time, my first degree was in economics, even economics. So, um, but, but I think this is gradually changing, but it, I, I believe it's still a problem in schools. Uh, now you see a lot of uh, women going into being economists or being lawyers, or, but still science, we need to work at it. Uh, we still need to push a little bit more. Uh, when it comes to that, at least from my experience in, in, in my country and, and, and also in, in, in Europe. What about Japan? Because I guess you have an MBA and, and, and Akiko, you studied law. So mm -hmm. were you the odd ones out? What were the proportions? Is there more that could be done at a school time? Uh, I, I do not have a specific uh, numbers here at hand. But, uh, uh, in my generation, um, the number of the percentage of female students uh, studying law was relatively small. I think maybe less than 10 percent. I think, mm -hmm. but currently I think or more than 30 percent or 40 percent. It's dramatically increased. Growing. Mm -hmm. So regarding uh, legal work or economic e economist area, I think the situation has been has been has changed. I think. But regarding uh, so-called STEM, uh, scientific field, I think there's, uh, there has to be uh, something we have to work on. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding that area, I have my personal uh, episode. Can I switch to Japanese? <laughs> あの、私が、あの、大学生の時にですね、あの、高校生、女の子の女子高校生 こう、点数が低かったんですね、1回。で、その彼女のお母さんはこれを何とかしたいと言って、あの、私に何とかしてもらえませんかと。だけどやっぱり数学なんて無理ですかねっていうふうにおっしゃってたんですけども、で、私が
still come back, go back to the bias things. If you, when you were little, you were told you cannot do that. No, 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 that's not for you. Then you, okay, that's not for me. So I have to look at this part. But why, right? Uh, Lily, I, I, I've encountered a really interesting book I really want to introduce to every one of you. Uh, it's a Jewish, uh, Yuvav Harari. He wrote actually three books. That's a series. The first one is uh, uh, um, Sapien, Homo Sapien. That's for human, the history. And the second one is Homo Deus. That says the when when human become becomes God, and the third one is the 21 lessons for the 21st century. Go back to the Amazon if you can. I really highly recommend it. So um, there's a lot of points, but the only one I want to say is he said, according to Yuval, the human being is very good at storytelling. They create Bibles, they create uh, many religions, they create the concept of company, they create the concept of nations. All of this is a concept, but concept is not the truth. And he suggests to always focus on the truth, but not the concept. So back to this small topic, because he, he, he expanded the topic into two huge scale, but now today we are just only want to focus on the diversity. So this is the thing that we always have to focus on the fact. That girl can be the best in the class. Everybody can be the best in the class. And I guess every one of us could actually tell yeah. others that they can be the best in the class, or they can be part of shipping or... And it's interesting, actually, because I think Vista did that for me in 2012, because I was new in my role now, and I had a lot of doubt about my ability and my experience and finding the right way of leading an organization that at the time was already 40 years old, very well established, had an all-male board. Um, and I think it was actually the contact with role models and other examples, not people that were more senior to me or um, just people that had found a different path and were established where they are and had made a success of it. So I think it's a, it, it is interesting. It's a, and it's the storytelling as well. It's about mm -hmm. sharing stories, which is why I think that's a great story with the two girls. Mm -hmm. I think I'm sure one of them is a maths professor now. <laughs> <is she? laughs> and I also hope that we were doing can becoming a sort of positive brainwash mm. to the world. Mm. Well, there, there are a lot of questions on Slido which pertain specifically to the cultural mindset and what can we do in practice. I'm just wondering whether, are there any thoughts on the panel as to what every one of us could be doing to make sure that um, when we come back in 10 years' time to celebrate 170 years of the Port of Yokohama, <laughs> we don't have to talk about this topic? What do we do? How do we tackle it? Hmm. Do you have a bring your kids to work day? Is that, is that something that is done in the Port of Yokohama? Uh, Port of Yokohama, uh, we have, for example, I keep. Uh, we have right now 35 employees in our company. Almost 40% are female. Yes. And females are also taking the roles of the operation, you know, when the typhoon comes, they have to stay over at the office. They just do the same thing as men do. And I guess in our organization, probably an exception, we do not have this atmosphere, okay, like this, this sort of things has to be done by men or this sort of thing you have to do. I mean, we are not that biased, I, I, in my opinion. And uh, women are all encouraged to do what they would like to do. For example, taking this YMF organization, uh, it's a first, you know, attempt to organize an international forum like this, and uh, it's a launch event. It's a handmade and tailor-made. My uh, team, uh, half men, half women. You already met many of them. Uh, they were nervous. They didn't want to make mistakes, but they're doing what they're doing. I mean. This kind of big experience afterwards, when they go back, says, okay, this is something I thought I couldn't do, but I did. I mean, this kind of experience, just, just repeat it in your career life, and then you'll get your confidence, you'll get there. Mm -hmm. So you're just a professional, it doesn't matter what gender. Well, professional is, ca cannot be reached by a day, and you have to go step by step, but just keep doing this 
Simple is best. I, I just think as well is that we're not going to solve the problem overnight. But the more women come into leadership positions, the more it, it will attract more people to come into the industry because it will normalise things. If you think of the medical profession, maybe 30, 40 years ago, it was not 90% men, all doctors. You, you, you associated a doctor with being a man. That's certainly not the case now. I think more than 50, especially in the UK, more than 50% of the medical students are, are, are women. So that's, that's changed, and it's so changed, it's taken 30 years, but there's definitely that change. Same in the legal profession, you know, uh, the lawyer was always a man. And, and now that's completely, you know, that's, I believe, changed fundamentally. So I do think we may be behind the curve in shipping, mm. but I do think these sort of panels and, and is going to encourage more people that there is a route to the top, that they have a rewarding career ahead of them. So perhaps, in, perhaps 10 years is too soon, but maybe at the 180th uh, anniversary celebrations, it will be, that, that percentage will be much, much higher. But I, I think positively, I, I've seen it in myself in my own career. In, 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 you know, when I first went to sea, there was no women at sea at all. And that's changed. So it, these things do happen slowly, but perhaps not quick enough, but they are happening. So no, no space for positive discrimination? I don't think you need positive discrimination. I think it's, it's my daughter chose her career at sea. She wanted to be a vet. That was her burning ambition is to be a vet. And she loves animals, she still loves animals now. Uh, she, would, she would have been too soft to be a vet, if the truth be known. But, um, so she did all the things you meant to do. She worked on a farm, she did all these things, but she didn't quite get the grades at uh, her, her A-level. She got good grades, but not the grades you need to be a vet, which is you have to have A stars and everything because it's so competitive. And she said, I don't know what to do, Dad. I said, well, you could do worse than what I did, which was to go away to see. I've had a really good career. You know, there's, you know, and she said, oh, all right, then I'll do that then. And that's how she made her decision. So you know, that, was, that was positive, I, I think. And I hopefully now, now she sees it's a good career. She's, you know, we'll pass it on to our own children as well. And we will change the industry, maybe too slowly, but it's, it will change it all the same. Um, I, I think I said it best. Uh, the goal is to normalize diversity, and and what the advice you gave your daughter, it's it's um, not uh, yes, it's encouragement, of course, but it should be the case with whatever gender our child is. You just give them, you know, uh, the suggestions and and the opportunities to do something. It, it shouldn't make a difference if they're a girl or or, or a boy. Um, I definitely think ten years is too soon. Um, but I, I, I really don't mind that because I, I think to have a long-lasting effective change, it needs time. We cannot do change things in one day because then it's, it's shaky um, and we don't want to jeopardize this. Um, so um, we do need more time and uh, of course shipping is international and Having the privilege of being the president of WISTA International, we have 49 uh, national WISTA associations and in all parts of the world. And things are different in every part, and we're very aware of that. Um, so to have long-lasting change across the industry, it will take time. Uh, but it's fine, because we're there, and, and there are many people that are, are supportive of this. Um, and I do believe that even the people who are not supportive now or don't understand it, they will very soon when, um, well, change is upon us, but it will be much more evident in a few years. So, so I, I think um, it will come as a natural progression in the end. Do you agree? Okay. So now uh, I'd like to refer to the... Uh, situation of seafaring in Japan. Uh, I have been discussing about the uh, uh, gender issue as a whole so far, but switch uh, uh, to Japanese. Nihon no, so no, Gaiko, Kochi, Kokoni or Elkata, more Yoko Gozonja to my mosquito, more Nihon no Gaiko Kayun, there are more Nihon Jin no saying, a Hijoni Mahete, Kion Tikinia, Makakuji, no saying, Ga. あの、日本船舶の運航してる
で政府としてはその今内向については日本人船員だけですので、えー、若い人たちに、まあ、船員という仕事に関心をもらって関心を持ってもらって船員になってもらうための,あのいろんなあのアプローチをしているんですけどもなかなかあのうまくいっていないでそれはあの女性だけではなくて、まあ、女性はさらに少ないんですけども男性もなかなか船員の仕事に興味を持ってもらえていないということでいろんな、まあまあ、底上げをしようとしています。でその中で、えー、発見したことというのはですねあの高齢化していている中に若い船員20代その平均年齢が60歳のところにですねあの若い船員20代の船員を男性を1人入れてもすぐ辞めちゃうんですね。それはやはりその男性か女性かということではなくてやはりその同じような属性を持って同じようにこう話ができる仲間がいるかどうかによってかなりその職場環境でのストレスは減りますしあの職業として継続していく容易さというのはまあ非常に変わっていくということを我々はそのジェンダーではなくてそういった年齢のジェネレーション的なものでも見ております。でこれから我々がまあこののパネルのコンテクストで申し上げるとそのいろんな多様なタレントをそのいろんなインダストリーに入れていくという意味ではやはり働きやすい環境を作っていくということではことにおいてはその年齢の話もありますしジェンダーにおいてもですねやはり、まあ、近しい属性を多く入れることによって、まあ、あの継続性も図られるしおそらくパフォーマンスも上がるのではないかというのが我々の見立てであります。One more thing to add in order to not to talk about this empowering women issue in maybe decades, how, how can we do that? And the other suggestion is we, until then, we always talk about that. Until the day we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, noted. That's a good one. But I think actually coming back to your point, Akiko, it's, it's very interesting because I, I spoke. Um, to somebody about the, the female captain that was promoted by NYK recently. And I now understand she's not yet sailing in command because she's simply too young. And it's the expectations, I think, of seniority to have a certain position of power and influence. That is, it's not typically Japanese, it happens everywhere. And in fact, uh, in the tanker sector, one of the problems that we've been dealing with or trying to deal with is that we look at competency of a seafarer. And very often it's measured by the time they spent in rank or with a company. And even our charterers have a very simple matrix, and they say X number of years in rank with that company is required, and they use it as a quality measure. It has nothing to do with competency. So um, it's, it's something that it's typically shipping, I guess.、Uh, We are trying to look at it with, with different ways of assessing competency, not just looking at certificates, looking at、um, a true competency in terms of measured competency, looking at soft skills as well, communication, leadership.、Um, so I think we're modernizing this industry slowly.、Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering whether this modernization is going to help us with the empowering piece, because, of course, with new technologies, there will be. Possibly more flexible jobs available because there will not necessarily be everyone on board ship. There might be more shore based operations, more automation,、um, maybe more flexible work environments, safer work environments.、Um, possibly, I think, also addressing the social part, having a cohort of people, colleagues that you can relate to because they're not completely different in, in gender or in age. So, Is that, do you see that changing? I mean, just starting with you, Sakura, in the port environment, is that something you see happening? That the、But、jobs I, themselves are changing? Right, I think absolutely, yes.、Um, I remember last time in、uh, an, another panel in IMO, because that was、uh, the port sessions, when people ask me,、uh, is、uh, the port conditions not good for women to work? Well, this is a question, yes and no. If you think the, the poor conditions is, is hard, so it's equally hard for women and for men. Maybe men can more take it because、uh, look at the percentage.、Um, the men in the、uh, workforce is much more bigger than the women, right? But as a matter of fact, even in the very front line, women are still there, even today. But when we can improve the working environment, when the technology innovation c o m e into play, For example, you can remote control or do the、uh, full automations. Then, of course, it's easier for women to start the career in these sections. Absolutely, yes. Okay. 
あの冒頭にその日本ではそのウェマンエンパワーメントというのがマリタイムセクターだけじゃなくて国全体のアジェンダだというふうに申し上げたんですけどもあのそのま,ざまさにその理由がですねもちろんそ,のそれぞれ同じ才能を持っている人間に活躍してもらうということはあるんですけどもあのより切実な問題として日本はあの少子高齢化が進んでいて労働力がですね圧倒的に減ってきていると。でこれがその伝統的なです、ね、家庭観を超えて女性にもっと社会進出をしてもらわないといけないとしてほしいではなくてもらわないともう日本の経済社会が成り立たないと、まあ、そういった現実もあるわけですでそこで女性がそういった社会進出をすることによってこれまでの働き方でいいのかという逆にあの男性も含めたです、ね、働き方の見直しということにつながっていっていますでそれはその技術の進展もそういった働きの改革を促すことになると思いますしそういった技術面からのアプローチもありますしそういった社会的なニーズがより高い技術を求めるということもあって相互に作用していい方向に行くのではないかというふうに思います。I'm just wondering, I'm looking at you, Despina, because of course you have built a business as a CEO. Um, you have done an MBA while you became a mother、um, with your first child. Yes, I did that at the same time. <laughs> Crazy <laughs> juggling.、Um, how did you manage? Was、I、it just get on with it? I mean, what, what is there that you can do? It's, it's a person, personal choice to have a career, and it's a personal choice for anyone who、uh, decides to have a career. And of course, there's a lot of support at home. Uh, and it's, the support is needed once you have a child,、uh, and my child is still very young.、Um, but、um, it's, it's my decision. So, as I said, you just get on with it.、Uh, you try to manage your schedule as much as you can. Time management is very important.、Um, but I, I think what's the real driver in, in my case is、uh, I love the industry I'm in, I, I have ambition. Um, there's a lot of things I still want to do.、Um, so that's that. It's, it's nothing complicated. It's like、uh, loving the industry that I'm in and, and wanting to do things in it.、Um, uh, having an understanding family is, is very important, as I said, especially after having a child. But, um, um, you know,、uh, What my advice would be if, if you want to have a career and you're a woman in my situation and having a young child, is try to find support.、Um, uh, I think it's long gone the, the notion of women being, having superpowers if they want to do everything. No, it's about managing things correctly.、Mm -hmm. And, and、uh, I think we should、uh, bust that myth because the, it's that myth that stops more women. Trying to uh, uh, go after their goals. It, it can't be done. It's something that can't be done. Well, and I'm wondering whether that links us back to what Akiko was saying, because I guess if you were saying it is effectively a woman's duty to be part of the, part of the, the economy and, and be part of the labor force, then what we also need to look at is, of course, the support system, because that is one thing we can never share. Biology dictates that it's only women that can have the children. So, While society needs that, that function, it's something that, of course, we would need to support. And I think that's possibly something that, certainly in our industry, is, it's coming. There's a lot of people that are much more flexible with, with career progression and things like that, but it's, it's just something that isn't normal yet. We're not seeing it enough yet. I think. And I don't want to be misunderstood, it's not easy,、hmm? um, but it's manageable. And at the same time, I don't think it's easy for men who are at sea and have a family back home. So th there are difficulties for everyone in the industry.、Uh, it's, it's the way we, we manage them that is,、uh, that is uh, um, you know, what needs to be discussed. And, and just to be able to give the opportunities to women who want to have a family and, and they need to be part of the economy. We need these women in our economies. Yeah. There is actually something that always used to bug me when I was, when I was a student, because in Germany there, there used to be the rule that all the young men, so my cohort of,、uh, of colleagues in, in university, for example, or after school, had to do either military service or social service. But we didn't as women. And I could never understand why until I actually asked the question very provocatively to one of our local politicians. And he actually told me that the reason the young men had to do either military or social service, so effectively work as a,、um, 
as an auxiliary nurse, for example, or drive ambulances or something for a year um, at a young age, they said, well, women don't have to do that. Um, there's no requirement because women are the ones that are childbearing. So you will give your service to society a different way. Um, I never agreed with that because I, I wanted to do the social service, but it wasn't open to women at the time. I never had children, so um, I didn't render my service to my country, which is, which is really the, the wrong way, I think. But support systems, I think we can look at. Yes. Um, I don't know if that's something that's, that we can take away. We have about five minutes left on this panel now, and I'm just wondering, can I, can I have another round of this panel and say, what can, we, what can everyone in this room do when we walk out of here? What's the one thing? So that, you know, maybe not in 10 years, but in 20 years, we don't have to talk about it again. Should I start while you're thinking? I mean, why, what, what I'm thinking is, I'm, and I've, I've done this actually actively, is I've tried to be conscious of my own bias. So um, there is, if anyone is interested, on the Harvard uh, website, there's a fantastic tool where you can test yourself <laughs> for your unconscious bias. It's just an online test, and you go through and you answer a bunch of questions, and they basically measure how long it takes you to decide one way or another. <laughs> and there's different topical areas that you can, you can test yourself on, and you can, you can find out whether unconsciously, just by the millisecond it takes you longer to decide for one or the other option, you are biased in one way or another. And it's, it's very insightful, I thought. But I've, I've taken that further, so for our recruitment, for example, we are now decoding all our advertising, so it has gender-neutral language, um, when the CVs get received, we have somebody in the team that isn't part of the recruitment process that removes the names. So we don't know whether it's a male or female name or whether it's an Indian name or a German one. And it helps us be more open-minded about who we're actually looking at and invite for interview. And they're, they're tiny little steps, but I'm hoping that over time they will have some real impact. So that's my little piece. So perhaps it's, I'll go next. I think keep an open mind. I think what, one of the great things I took away from my seafaring career is you learn to accept people for who they were at sea because it's about a teamwork on board a ship. So it doesn't matter what people look like or, or characteristics or anything like that. Can they do the job? And I think to me, if people can walk away keeping an open mind and look at people for what they can contribute, that to me is the most important thing to take away. Mm -hmm. um. Perhaps what I'm going to say is a little bit provocative, but I think we need to be more pragmatists. And I think we need to remove emotion from this discussion. Mm -hmm. Because when we um, have this discussion and are emotional about it, then it's very difficult to um, see the right way. Um, it's of course an emotional subject um, and, and it's something that it's been discussed for, for decades now. Um, and of course, having diversity in the industry and having women been included, th this is something I've said a few times now, it's the fair thing to do. But unfortunately, companies that are for profit, they don't always care what the fair thing to do is. And, and that's how it is. I own a business and, and, and I know that. But um, we need to start discussing about the benefits of diversity in the industry and the opportunities. And yes, the fairness as well, because that's an important element. We, um, uh, we shouldn't dismiss that or, or discount that or being, be so cynical to not talk about fairness. Um, but we, we really need to start discussing more the actual benefits for a business and for the industry, because that will really make us see more clearly. Um, now, something more tangible. Within our company, we are very aware of diversity within um, the company. So, uh, for example, uh, there's a very clear direction um, uh, in terms of pay. Uh, there's no, we don't distinguish between uh, the, the pay between men and women. It's equal for the same position. Um, for example, in the past we had teams where there were only men and teams where we only had women. And we, we said this cannot go on, so we hired men for the all women's team and women for the all men's team. So we started balancing things out. I think finding that balance is the most important thing when it comes to, to diversity. Fantastic. Anything to add? Anything you're taking away? 
うんあのあ私もあの同意するところがあるんですけどあまり対立的に考えない方がいいと思います。要はいろんあらゆる組織であったり国家であったりする中でそのいろんな人がいるそのタレントをです、ね、最大限に生かしてその経済活動であれ行政であれにそのマキシマムなあの効果をもたらすような仕組みなり社会を作っていくということが大事なんだろうと思います。でそういった中で、まあ、あのそのバイオロジカルには女性だけがやはりまあ出産をしっていうことがあるのでそこのところをまあどうカバーするかっていうことだと思いますけれども私はいろんなところで言ってるのは男性にも女性にも平等に1日は24時間しかないのでその家事労働を全部女性がやった上で働くってそれは基本的に不可能。なわけでありましてそういったの合理的な思考であの全体でベネフィットを上げていくというようなあの思考を形態をみんなで共有することができればですねかなり状況は改善していくのではないかと思います。So, Kura? Quite agree with、uh, the spina says take the emotion out.、Mm-hmm. At the personal level, just focus on the fact and focus on what you can do, what you cannot. Well, some, some It's about timing. Maybe it's something that you think you cannot do now, but you can do it in the future if you do what you can correctly. You know, this is just、uh, accumulating the experience and to reach the states that you once thought impossible. That's a personal level. And for the society or system,、uh, system level, it's being more encouraging. Like in my opening, the story that I share with everybody. If you just look at these women, or the sometimes it doesn't necessary to be women or minority, I see. There's a lot of minority, except women, okay, in a society. How to treat them equal? Just treat them like your own daughter. <laughs> this is a, we need some emotion in the system, in the in a societal level. Yeah, that's. My personal thoughts. Okay.、Mm. So, in summaries, ladies and gentlemen, let's play to our strengths and let's play together. And now I think we're having coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Thank panel. Thank you.